If you listen to the critics, if you listen to your own doubts and call them reasons, you may never find the drive to go back to school. But a little change in direction, a new perspective, and the right program may make your successful new path a reality. The Accelerated Degree Program at Albright College. Start your degree or complete your degree one night a week in as little as two years. Albright College, a different way of thinking. Good evening and welcome to the Albright Scholar for March 2016. My name is John Pankratz. I teach history at Albright, and each month it's my privilege to welcome BCTV viewers and residents of Greater Reading to take a glimpse inside our learning community up here on North 13th Street, to look at the work being done by teachers and students, and to think about its impact upon all of us. Well, tonight we're going to talk about a topic that affects all of us, affects our personal histories, affects uh, American culture today and world civilization, and affects the current political climate as well. Immigration. People have been moving around the surface of the earth now for uh, uh, probably hundreds of thousands of years, and uh, they haven't stopped and don't show any signs of, of uh, stopping that movement. And we're here with a, an expert on immigration who's going to talk both about her own research and about an upcoming campus conversation at Albright. I'm welcoming Beth Keister, Professor of Sociology at Albright. Welcome, Beth. Thanks for having me, John. I'm glad to have you back on the show. This is your second time. It is, uh, it us. is. I'm starting to take the training wheels off a little bit here at Albright. Yeah, very much so, very much so. We, we appreciate that. Last time mm -hmm. we were talking about families and uh, uh, those kinds of issues, and, and, and today we're, we're talking about this whole big theme about, of, of immigration. Uh, and you're coming at it from, from several different perspectives. I am, absolutely. Um, and I tie this together uh, in the classroom as well. Mm -hmm. I just finished up this fall teaching a senior level course on immigration and transnational families oh, um, and the impact that immigration has on families um, when they move as well as the impact it has particularly on, on kids mm -hmm. um, when, when uh, mom and or dad leave and, and aren't around and aren't part of the physical physical family. Right. Uh, so that separation that takes place when one, one fragment of the family is moving and the other parts are left behind. Absolutely. Absolutely. Sort of this is a very, very complex issue. Oh, un undoubtedly. Undoubtedly. Um, and that was... Uh, it, there's so many different components to it, mm -hmm. culturally and economics mm -hmm. and politically, psychologically, uh, re religiously. Mm -hmm. um, there's so many different topics. And that was really what drove uh, myself and my colleagues um, to do some of the research that we did and how, um, how does immigration policy, how do laws mm -hmm. regarding immigration, how do they get passed? Yeah. Um, especially in really unexpected conditions, which is what we were finding ourselves in the middle of. Right. I know, I know uh, your recent piece in the Journal of Sociology and Social Work uh, is about immigration policy and an emerging narrative in the state of Utah. Absolutely. Uh, it came on the, on the cusps of a law that a lot of people knew about. It got national attention in Arizona, mm -hmm. um, SB 1070, or what most people know as the show me your papers law. Right. Um, that was very harsh, uh, very, uh, very much about finding immigrants and, and deporting them mm -hmm. um, with, with officers able to kind of just stop people and, and ask me, you know, show me your papers. And stop American citizens and do that. Uh, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And we saw a very, everybody saw a very similar thing, or were very concerned that a very similar thing was about to Certainly happen in Utah. Certainly the potential was there in Utah. Mm -hmm. Very culturally similar, religiously similar, politically similar, and uh, a group of, of people got together and said, that is not what we want for the mm -hmm. state of Utah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they ended up passing something that to most people would be considered incredibly progressive mm -hmm. um, and a, a 180 of, of what the show me your papers law was all about. And we stopped and said, what on earth just happened? Because it was so unexpected and we, we just had to find out how that happened and um, what kind of implications it might even have on a, on a national 
stage. Mm -hmm. I've read your your piece, and and you uh, quote the 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 famous phrase, uh, "Politics makes strange bedfellows." Uh, the other great aphorism of uh, of American uh, politics is, "All politics are local." And, Absolutely. And I I think that's illustrated in your paper as well. That in some ways Utah is a special place. It, it really was. It really was. Um, and we've seen. Uh, not a lot of, of, of other, uh, we've seen other states do things that were similar. Mm -hmm. um, we, we talked to people, so there was, a, one of the main bills that was passed as part of what was going on in Utah uh, was passed in 2011. Utah actually has its own guest worker program mm -hmm. on the books. Hmm. It was passed uh, into law, um, the governor signed it, it's a, it's a valid piece of legislation. That happened in March of 2011, but it had a, a start date of July 2013. Okay. And so that was right about the time we started talking to people was to say, are you gonna let this go into effect? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and it's, it got kicked down the road because there was this optimism uh, that, that, that what was happening in Utah uh, was being recognized. President Obama talked about Utah as, as a viable pathway. It's kind of a model. Um, it, the New York Times picked up what was going on and said this might be a good model. Mm -hmm. um, the Gang of Eight, mm -hmm. uh, uh, there were four Republicans and four Democrats that put together a bill that looks very, very similar to mm -hmm. what Utah did. Um, and people in Utah had such high hopes. They said, we don't want to enact this, this law because, quite frankly, it's illegal because the federal government has jurisdiction right. when it comes to immigration. And they were kind of, Utah was going to kind of play chicken with the federal government and say, you've been really incapable of yeah. passing anything, mm -hmm. so we're going to take care of it. Um, so they kicked it down the road to 2015. Um, and with the current state of, of, of Congress and politics, they kicked it down the road again. So yeah. they're, uh, Utah, ha they've been unwilling to kind of take on the federal government, but it's also because they're so optimistic that there might be some federal changes in the future. We will see. We will see. Certainly uh, the coalition that you describe or the, the group of people come from diverse areas of Utah political life and U Utah society. Uh, and part of the trouble with formulating a federal uh, immigration reform policy is that this issue or positions on this issue don't fall neatly within either of the major political parties. No, it doesn't. It's, it's hell for, for Republicans to talk about immigration because on the one part, business Republicans, employers, are very interested mm -hmm. in an influx into the labor pool, s labor that they need, but also labor that's affordable. But then for the xenophobes out there, the, the politics of fear and hatred and suspicion, uh, that sells well during an election year. And so that component of the Republican Party has to be placated or satisfied uh, as well. So it's, it's, it's really a... a uh, schizophrenic uh, kind it, of response. It is, and it's it's so strange. And, and really, this was kind of the crux of what we found. Is we talked to people again, church leaders, business leaders, politicians, both Republicans and Democrats, uh, uh, immigration coalition leaders, and what they did is they came together and they created this 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 compact. It was called the Utah Compact. It had absolutely no legal binding. Mm -hmm. It was a one. It was an eight and a half by eleven one-sided document that said, "Here are five things that we 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 hold to be dear and important." Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and they and that document was really about family values. It was about um, not breaking families up. It was about the economic contributions of immigrants. Yep. Um, and they went forward with this compact. They got all these signatures. They had a big public release, a big signing that said we have all these signatures of all these really diverse, interested parties. And they did that in November of 2010. And the idea was, and what a lot of the people we talked to said, is this tool became a, a shield. They, people mm -hmm. we talked to called it a shield, an umbrella, a cover, because it gave... For politicians. It, for politicians, absolutely, because it gave them an excuse to do the right thing, to yeah. vote with their hearts, to vote in the interest of human rights and this new humanitarian shaping mm -hmm. of what an immigrant was and what the immigrant experience was. 
Um, and they, politicians attribute their success in passing things like the guest worker program to the existence of the Utah Compact. Mm -hmm. The Utah Compact has since gone national uh, through a website called uh, Bibles, Badges, Bibles, Badges, and Businesses, mm -hmm. which is the three kind of key components, uh, uh, churches, businesses, and law enforcement. Mm -hmm. um, and so other states have since gone to that website and developed their own similar compacts. And again, that's it's really similar to what the Gang of Eight was trying to do, yeah. um, but hit a kind of a congressional wall. Yeah. In, in Utah, did, uh, did the LDS church... Uh, play a, a crucial role? They did in a really backdoor kind of way. Yeah. They were not official signers. They were asked to be official signers. The Catholic Church signed on, mm -hmm. uh, the Presbyterian Church signed on. So there were, there were churches who were official signers to the compact. Um, the LDS Church was invited. Uh, they declined to participate. However, on the exact same day from their, their press room, they released a statement saying that they were um, in support of it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and again, that support helped a lot of um, politicians feel like they had the support they needed to vote in the way that they did. Right, and absolutely crucial in, in yeah. Utah. Yeah. yeah. And it has to do, I guess, with the, the, the Mormon Church's uh, history of evangelism and moving out in, into the world, and it's a very global institution, and is in some ways connected to other parts of the world that often provide sources of immigrants to the United States. And, and you know, their fastest growing, um, their fastest growing global population is in Latin America right now. Mm -hmm. Um, but also just Utah has a real sense of hospitality and welcoming. There are cities, we have like lots and lots of refugees in mm -hmm, Utah. Mm -hmm. um, so Utah in and of itself has always had sort of a welcoming um, uh, philosophy, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's, it's been in kind of, being pro-immigrant really shouldn't have come maybe quite as, as much of a surprise as it did. Right, but. yeah. Well, uh, the American tradition is, again, a really mixed one. I mean, uh, Keister, Pankratz, I, I don't think those are uh, Lene Lenape names. Uh, uh, so uh, we somehow got to this part of the, the, the globe uh, at, at some point. And um, in general, North America, all, all the Americas have been very welcoming to people coming across uh, different oceans because if you're going to develop these continents, then you need labor. Sometimes you force people to come uh, across the ocean uh, into this part of the world. We so, talked to 21 different people, and 19 of them mentioned economics as a part of their con the conversation about yeah. shaping the contribution of immigrants. I, you know, I think it was the Huffington Post. There was just a recent article about uh, how immigrants contribute some $11 billion to the economy. Um, yeah. And they don't draw a dime of things like social security, no. um, or anything like that. So they they are big contributors, and they draw very few resources. Mm -hmm. In the contemporary context, in absolutely the, yes. In in the historical context, um, they built America. Yes. Right. So, at, at, but of course, the other historical perspective that I, I would mention is that at different junctures, at moments of crisis, at moments of uncertainty, then the most recent wave of immig immigrants become a very handy target for political demagogues to uh, rally their troops. Oh, absolutely. You know, I, in this class I, was, I mentioned, we talked a lot about the Bracero Program, mm -hmm. uh, which is a, a very cordial relationship between the United States and Mexico in the 1960s. And it was after World War, uh, it was after World War II, there was a lack of, or it, it started during World War II and there was a lack of, of workers in the country. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the United States said to Mexico, you guys need some money, we need some people. They had this great deal. And then of course the program quickly ended and the mm -hmm. United States said, we're done, um, please go away now. And they had done that already after World War I uh, in, a, in a very similar circumstance. And, and my students kind of said, that doesn't seem quite right. We invite them in and we kick them out and we invite them in and we kick them out. Mm -hmm. And now people seem shocked that they don't necessarily want to leave. Um, right. 
when they've developed, you know, we've, we've relied on them for so much. Right, and they've been integrated economically mm -hmm. and socially into, in, into the society. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, well, we can go back to the Irish in the 1840s and 50s. We can go to the Chinese in the 1870s and 80s as well. We can find similar on-again, off-again, hot and cold. Uh, mixed reactions. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And the, the irony being, uh, we tried to stop that in 1965. Uh, Johnson signed some immigration, na immigration and nationality uh, legislation to try to say we're gonna, we need to get the race out of it. Mm -hmm. We want immigration to be about families and family reunification. Um, and the irony is what contemporary uh, policy looks like and it is quite d divisive yeah. and it creates these these transnational families um, even when the families don't want to be transnational right right, right. So. well all of these perspectives are going to be on the table in a couple weeks right uh, ab ab absolutely Albright is hosting a campus conversation we, we do uh, sort of a series of round tables uh, each year that uh, address big issues mm -hmm. Uh, and this year, the, the issue is, um, is immigration. And I know that you're partnering with our visiting NEH humanities professor, Kavita Daya. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, she's going to have a, a large part to do with this as well. Um, she brings uh, a whole other perspective. Um, I tend to have more to do with sort of the Latin American context. She mm -hmm. has a lot more to do with the Middle Eastern and the Asian context. Mm -hmm. um, I have more of a policy policy spin. She has more of a cultural spin. Right. So together we're going to tell one really great story and have one really great conversation um, with the students about what is an immigrant, what does immigration look like, mm -hmm. how is it something that's been socially constructed, um, as well as delving into the experience of immigrants and immigrant families yeah, as well. Yeah, absolutely. I know that Kavita is, a, is an expert on uh, the partition uh, of the Indian subcontinent mm -hmm. uh, in the wake of independence and uh, after the Second World War, where Pakistan and India went separate ways, except that it was really one integrated complex society. And so you have essentially the forced migration of Muslims mm -hmm. to uh, East Pakistan and West Pakistan uh, in a very short period of time and accompanied with a great deal of suffering and violence. Yeah, I mean, even just this idea about forced, yes. forced immigration. Um, we're seeing that in a more contemporary context now, obviously, with the Syrian refugees. refugees yeah. um, and, you know, again, to think immigrant, uh, that immigrant means one thing, it's so much more diverse than that, when you, especially when you add the, that component of forced migration. Yep. Um, one of the, uh, again, thinking about the Latin American context, one of the things we're seeing a rise in is unaccompanied minors. Mm -hmm. um, and not necessarily coming from Mexico, they're coming through, through Mexico, Mexico. Yep. from Nicaragua, from Honduras, mm -hmm. very war-torn countries, uh, drug lords, uh, and, and that a bottle of water and a sack lunch is, better, is more hope for them to cross multiple international borders is, is the better alternative for them than staying where they're at. Mm -hmm. um, it's a forced migration is what that is. Of course it is, yeah. So. Uh, migration is always a, uh, a nexus of push and pull, the things pushing you from your home society and the things pulling you to the, to the new society. And sometimes the pull is the dominant factor that there are economic opportunities, there's jobs, there's mm -hmm. employment. Uh, but sometimes uh, situations become so desperate, uh, politically, socially, in, in terms of personal safety, uh, that, yeah, r terrible risks are taken in order to get out. And, and when you have a, the push and the pull working in the same direction, you've yeah. got these pushes from some of these countries, uh, terrible, terrible conditions, pushing you away, and you've got a country like the United States with so much promise mm -hmm. and so much economic need. Well, that, yeah. For the... For, for the for, for people who are willing to work and do jobs. You know, one of the things that the people told us, you know, agriculture in this country relies so much on immigrants. Farmers saying, look, I'm losing millions of dollars because it is rotting in the fields because I can't get anybody to go pick it. Because it can't be picked in a timely way, right. Um, well, that's a story that we know here in Berks County, right? Yeah. right. Uh, the, the mushroom supply of the United States depends on uh, immigrant labor. Mm -hmm. yeah. And those employers are certainly happy to employ those people. Uh, yes, absolutely. So you've got the push and the pull.
Yeah. Uh, the interesting thing is, uh, of course, that as people are here for a while, in my case, three generations, uh, um, you you do assimilate. You you mm -hmm. bring something of your home culture uh, to America, but you also adopt uh, uh, aspects of the culture that are already here. And that issue of identity, I, I think, is going to be a part of the camp campus mm -hmm. conversation as well. Oh, ab yeah, absolutely. And and what. Um, you know what that that new host country looks like, and their their attitudes, mm -hmm. uh, and their policies towards those immigrants is going to shape their experience and what um, what those immigrants experience once they get there, and, and um, whether they try to assimilate, whether they um, find themselves hiding in the shadows. So our our article was called "Bringing Them Out of the Shadows" because so many people talked about. The way immigrants were really hiding mm -hmm. because of the because, because of the of their legal because of the status. culture because yep. of the legal status because of just the the vitriol in the discussion about immigrants whether they were documented or not these mm -hmm. populations are are hiding in the shadows um, because even with the documents they're being treated in a, a very suspicious very criminalized way and right. so. Um, trying to bring them out of the shadows was the idea of the Utah Compact. Yeah, yeah. I think one of the reasons um, there's so much emotion around this issue is that identity is a difficult goal for any American, right? We, we, most of us have been here, our families have been here an average of maybe 100 years. If you're an African American, maybe 200, 250 years. As a, as a group, African Americans are the most American Americans. Um, almost nobody came over on the Mayflower, so certainly my four, forebears didn't. Um, and uh, so, yeah, it's, it's a sort of a recent thing. And I think because it's a little bit uncertain in our own minds, we identify our Americanness in contrast to the most recent arrival. Absolutely. It's, it's a very opportunistic way of thinking, and it's a kind of dishonest way of thinking as well. It is. It is, and and again, like you said, if we if we go back to Ellis Island, um, you know, first it was the Irish. Nobody wanted the Irish, and then you know the Germans came or the Polish came, and mm -hmm. it was always you know whoever the newest the newest wave of immigrants was was sort of the the shunned group. Immigration's good until until it's that group, yeah. until it's not us. Right. If people want to come to your country, that's a sign of health. Right. I think, so. I, I, I think we should uh, view it. Uh, as a compliment, I think we should feel flattered. Uh, I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, when, when people don't want to immigrate to the United States, then we know that our society is going to be in trouble. I think so. Great. Well, there's so much more to say, and I'm, I'm very much looking forward to this uh, campus conversation on April 6th uh, with you and Kavita and a number of my colleagues and all of our students as well. Yeah, Good. absolutely. Beth, thank you so much for being my guest on uh, The Albright Scholar. Thank you so much, John. Good. We'll look forward to seeing you again in another month on the next edition of The Albright Scholar. Good night. If you listen to the critics, if you listen to your own doubts and call them reasons, you may never find the drive to go back to school. But a little change in direction, a new perspective, and the right program may make your successful new path a reality. The Accelerated Degree Program at Albright College. Start your degree or complete your degree one night a week in as little as two years. Albright College, a different way of thinking.